Hello, my name is Thomas McKenna, and I am the founder and president of Catholic Action for Faith and Family. I'd like to welcome you today to the first phone call that we're going to do with His Eminence Raymond Cardinal Burke that will be a monthly event for our listeners and followers. I want to thank especially the faith defenders and those donors of Catholic Action who through their generosity have made it possible for us to take this initiative and many of the other initiatives that we do to serve the church and to help His Eminence Cardinal Burke. I would like to say that thank you and thank you for joining me today. So now let's call His Eminence. Hello, Your Eminence? Yes, hello, Thomas. Yes, Your Eminence, it's wonderful to be speaking with you today, and I'm very grateful that you're able to join us and respond to some questions. Uh, I'll begin here. I, we, we have um, this, the first month here. These are some questions that I've been, heard and that I, I'm asking, and, and f following after that, throughout the rest of the months, we'll be taking questions from the faithful. But So I would like to... Um, say that as we, as we continue to pass through this crisis of abuse in the church, it seems there are two positions taking hold. Both are extreme. I'd like to ask your opinion on each one with the goal to find out just the right balance, a balance that is healthy and leads to authentic progress. So the first one is, the growing, there is a growing number of people calling for the abandonment of the church. Can your eminence share your view on why leaving the church is absolutely wrong strategy at this time and offer a word of encouragement for those thinking that? Yes, I understand fully the, the tremendous disillusionment uh, uh, of so many of the faithful and at the same time their sense that the church has abandoned them. And, uh, and, and so some have taken this uh, uh, position that uh, to to leave the church, but this is uh, is wrong because uh, the church is holy. The church is Jesus Christ Himself alive for us in, in in the world, and we we cannot leave the church. We cannot abandon our Lord, who promised that He would be with us always, even until the end of time. And so uh, we cannot permit that the sins, no matter how terrible uh, they are, of of priests or anyone else in the church, sins done uh, using the name of the church. Uh, we cannot permit them to, to cloud our vision or to, to blind us to the great beauty of the church and, and uh, as our Lord constituted it from the very uh, beginning of his public ministry. And so we, what we have to do in these situations when we're tempted to, to abandon the church is to is to pray to our Lord and to give ourselves to our Lord uh, even more fervently and to try to, to deepen our appreciation of what he teaches us in the church and above all to, to see more clearly how he acts uh, on our behalf in a most wonderful way in the church, especially through the sacraments and how he also gives us the sound direction, the sound discipline for our lives that leads to eternal life. So the, the, the first option uh, can, can never be right, and we must never submit. This is a, a temptation which, which comes from the evil one, to a temptation to, to lose faith in our Lord himself as he has promised to be with us in his holy church. Thank you, Your Eminence. Now, a, a follow-up to the other uh, balance I'd like to ask. An understandably frustrated and angry laity are desiring to rise up and manage church governments. Your Eminence, what is at stake with this approach and what is the appropriate involvement of the laity who desire to help reestablish the faith and confidence across the laity, the clergy, and the hierarchy? What is, what is the true balance there? Yes, I also I understand very well that, that uh, many of the faithful are are, are so profoundly disappointed with the lack of leadership on the part of the bishops, the lack of correct action, and even correct action on the part of the Holy See in, in terms of, of these terrible crimes. And uh, so the, the temptation here too is to, is to think to remake the church in some way to, to prevent uh, these uh, grievous failures. Uh, but here, too, we must look to our Lord himself who, who constituted the church with a hierarchy. 
uh, he, from the very beginning of his public ministry, took the twelve apart and formed them to be true shepherds of the of the flock, acting in his own person. And at the Last Supper, when he instituted the Holy Eucharist, at the same time he instituted the Holy Priesthood, giving those whom he uh, called to be shepherds the, the grace to be so. And uh, so, first of all, we must never uh, uh, lose track of the of the truth that it is a responsibility of the Holy Father to be the principle of unity of all the bishops and of all the faithful and to, to discipline appropriately and according to the laws of the church bishops. And it's the uh, responsibility, grace, uh, a God-given responsibility of uh, bishops to, to discipline priests and to, uh, and to keep the right order in the church among the clergy. This does not mean, however, that the lay faithful do not have an important part to play. And in fact, in the Code of Canon Law, it makes it very clear that, that the laity not only have the, the right, but in fact the duty to make known to the, to the Holy Father and to the bishops their deep concerns about the church and also to offer their uh, gifts, their particular talents and knowledge uh, to, to the bishops and to the Holy Father in, in dealing with s some of the tremendous challenges which the church faces. And so what we, we need at the present moment is for the Holy Father and the bishops to assume their proper responsibility and to exercise it in a way according to the law of the church. And in that way too, to, to involve, uh, to listen fully to the lay faithful and to, to their deep concerns about what is happening, what has happened, and at the same time to involve uh, the, the same lay faithful in finding ways to address effectively uh, these challenges so that the church's teaching is more clearly proclaimed and so that her discipline is applied uh, uh, correctly for the good of all. Yes, thank you, Your Eminence. I, I, I think that people have to realize that even in crises like this, it's not the first crisis of this sort, and it won't be the last, but that we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as so to say. And I, I think that's kind of a tendency. So even good intentioned people who want to help clean things up or straighten things out um, need to keep that balanced there, that virtue lies in the middle. Yes, yeah, so we have to remember, we have a tendency to think that this is the first time the church has dealt with the problem of abuse uh, of, of children by priests, by clerics. It's not in the whole history of the of the church's law, there are uh, canons, there are laws which uh, appoint for the correct way of dealing with accusations of such abuse so as to both uh, protect uh, the, the, the good name and the, the, uh, of both the, the supposed victim and also of the supposed perpetrator and to get to the truth of the matter and then to apply the, the correct sanctions uh, uh, and so we, we have to remember that there's a the church has a whole history in, in this regard. Human beings, priests remain even though they're they're uh, consecrated as priests. They, they they remain human beings, and if they don't nurture properly their spiritual life uh, and, uh, and 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 guide themselves according to uh, the teachings of the church and and her laws they can fall into grave sin. And we, the church has always known to deal with that and we have to uh, look to also to our whole tradition to see how effectively to deal with these situations. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Your Eminence. The final, the final question I'd like to ask you today, Your Eminence, is that um, in, with, in face of that, the situation going on in the world and especially the sex abuse, another aspect some, some people have raised in some parts of the world some voices are renewing the notion that the vow of celibacy is somehow at the root of the abuse scandal, and therefore they say that if the clergy were allowed to marry, that would help solve the abuse crisis, and then therefore also help solve the vocation crisis. Would you agree with that? Uh, not at all. I, I've lived the promise of celibacy now some uh, uh, 40, 40 two years and, uh, uh, no, excuse me, it's getting longer than that, it'll be uh, 44 years this year. And uh, the uh, celibacy helps one to, to be holy 
uh, helps one to have good and, and uh, healthy relationships with other people. It, there's nothing about celibacy that would lead one to commit such acts. And uh, we have to remember that the, the great majority of the acts of sexual abuse are, are committed by people who are married. Uh, they happen in, in homes and in other situations. It isn't that either celibacy or marriage uh, will, will keep one from uh, committing such acts. It's, uh, it's because these acts are, are sins of, of, of wrong desires, of lustful desires that are completely disordered. Uh, directed toward children, uh, and uh, uh, and so they, uh, we, we have to remember that in both in the married life and in celibacy, grace is given to lead a life of chastity. So it isn't at all the problem that uh, uh, it, it, it isn't at all that the problem is celibacy. In fact, celibacy is a great gift to the church, and here too it would be a, a tremendous mistake uh, to, to think that, that the celibacy, which is leading priests to do immoral acts and therefore to, uh, to attack or to uh, try to eliminate something that our Lord himself chose uh, for his priestly ministry. He chose to be celibate and we, the church has always understood, even though she's permitted in some cases uh, a married clergy that, uh, that uh, the Lord's will is most perfectly accomplished uh, when the clergy imitate him also in his perfect continence. And so I, this is, I, I understand again, to, for, to someone who's not thinking deeply about it, uh, they can have this idea that somehow if you're married, you won't do these things. No, the, the answer to not doing these things is to address the wrong desires, the sinful desires in man, especially as they have to do with the the capital sin of lust. Your Eminence, thank you very much. That was very clarifying. And I think, I'm sure that our followers, our faith defenders and followers of Operation Storm Heaven, as myself, are very grateful for you sharing this time this month to help us. Uh, to close, Your Eminence, I want to thank you very much. And I'd like to ask if we, you could close, if you could give a blessing to all the faith defenders and the followers of Catholic Action. Yes, I'm very happy to, and I want to thank all those who, who are joining uh, the, the faith, who are faith defenders, who are joining in Operation Storm Heaven, and to encourage them also to uh, invite others to join this great spiritual work. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.